Hello and welcome back to another video on this channel. Hope you're having a great day. Today we're going to be talking all things Dostoevsky, Nietzsche and the problem of Kirillov, which is a series that we're talking going through in this channel. So essentially there are three main formulations of the problem of Kirillov and today we're going to be talking about the first one, which is the moral problem of Kirillov. The other two are indeed the problem of Kirillov in regards to the divine and the problem three is the problem of Kirillov in regards to human freedom. So essentially these three problems of Kirillov are indeed problems of atheism, hence the title that you've seen, and also the thumbnail. And since there's Nietzsche and Dostoevsky both have significant influences to this discussion, I will be referencing both of their works in this discussion. And, and that's kind of what I'm going to be talking today. I'm going to be talking about the problems of the death of God in regards to morality and why that is a significant problem of atheism. And Without further ado, let's get into the video. If you're interested in that, make sure you watch till the very end so you don't miss anything. And also that you, and if you enjoy this content and are looking forward to fur, fur, further future videos, my voice, is, my speaking is completely gone today. Make sure to, well, like and subscribe. It means a lot to me and will help this channel grow. So essentially, what is the problem of Kirillov and the moral problem of Kirillov in specific, to be more specific? Well, in my opinion, the moral problem of Kirillov is indeed surrounded or is based in Dostoevsky's phrase, without God, there is no virtue. And you might say, well, that sounds familiar, but a bit off. And the reason because of that is it's it's kind of the main root of where the other phrase that is commonly attributed to Dostoevsky, without God, there all things are permissible. That is a phrase which comes from this, the actual Dostoevsky phrase, which is without God, there is no virtue. The other one, which is indeed a development by later sources, says without God, all things are permissible, is quite similar to share the same themes, but there are some fundamental subtle and you might say some rather pedantic differences between them. One being the fact that there is no moral obligation either way, whereas what um, the other one is saying, and that's the first one I'm talking about, the second one, which is the all things are permissible one, does indeed seem to suggest that there is something that you can do, whereas the other one just says, well, whatever, you can kind of go on and do anything you want. And that will tie into the problem of Kirillov and freedom. However, I'll be talking about that in a later video because that, I think, deserves a own discussion of its own. So what we see here is that without God, there is absolutely no moral obligation. You can do whatever you want and you can kind of work towards Nietzsche's kind of the overman in the sense you create your own values, you create your own meaning and you create your own morals. So that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about in this video. And I just wanted to put it out there that while it is a common, more commonly or more recognized phrase that without God, all things are permissible, that's perhaps not the most original or the most traditional or appropriate representation of Dostoevsky's works. Rather, he's it's the latter it's the more original one, which is better, which is without a mortality of the soul or without God, all th there is no virtue. And it's the idea that there is a lack or a collapse of that moral landscape, which completely disappears without God. And, and today, instead of really talking, giving a complete discussion about, well, what theistic morality is the best divine command theory, natural moral law, or whatever you think about that. However, for now, it's just we're not talking too much about the theistic side of the morals. However, we're saying what happens if we take away God from the morality equation? What happens to humans? And Nietzsche's one, and Nietzsche, I think, phrases it beautifully. He says in the gay science, it, and that's a passage where God is dead comes from. And of course, it's also gotten from Thus Spoke Zarathustra and other ideas. However, it's best developed in the gay science in one of the passages. He says, well, God is dead. Must we not ourselves become God to appear worthy of it? When we take away God, we are faced with moral nihilism and a complete a complete destruction of the moral landscape. And as a result, we must ourselves make ourselves God to provide ourselves that structure, provide ourselves that meaning, to fight against nihilism. And the way to do that would indeed be to change away from that moral landscape, because that's kind of completely ruined already, but to change or move towards more pragmatic or a, a more hierarchical idea of of pragmatism and from that pragmatism you get what you should do and while it's quite while it, there is indeed quite some similarities with the normal moral language it is not necessarily the same thing what is more pragmatic is not more good it's in the moral sense is just more beneficial and that's 
And that's perhaps a bit of a difference between what Nietzsche says between good and evil and good and bad. Good and bad is what he supports, which is the pragmatic, the practical sense, whereas good and evil is the more moral sense, which he kind of says is a burden on human freedom and human conscience. So he's trying to throw away, throw that away. So this is just essentially trying to tell you that, well, without God, we have a massive problem in, well, morals, conscience, and the way we ought to act because God is whether you like it or not, has been the ultimate foundation, the grounding or the or the substrate upon which most systems or if not all systems in history have been built up upon. It's been a robust foundation for ideas like equality has been sufficient or well, has been really strong foundations for equality, treating others well, helping your neighbor, really do not kill, do not murder, everyone has intrinsic value. All of these things are fundamentally based off this originally quite theistic metaphysic or this theistic groundings. And of course, some people like to say, well, what about the Buddhists and the, or the Oriental traditions, which are not necessarily directly linked to theism. However, you can say that they still have a significant mystical or, or a mythical uh, orientation or foundations for example, the Tao and Taoism, or even in Buddhism, there's some sense of enlightenment, there's some sense of tra the transcendent realm, which cannot be denied. And and also, you can also perhaps look at the consequences in the idea that, well, even though they did have some of these ideas, they didn't really stick to them that well. Because if you just look at the 20th century, you can see that these countries, which had indeed, which were mainly based on a well, a non-theistic kind of religion or philosophy, they kind of abandoned those those values really quickly. For example, in China, in during the Cultural Revolution, what you did see was that while they did have some fundamental knowledge of what was right and wrong, they gave it up way quicker than the counterparts in Russia, especially during the moment of the Cultural Revolution, people were brainwashed. And since they didn't have that theistic grounding, the idea of the higher order or the higher, the higher kind of higher higher power which would lead to ultimate just like judgment and justification what we saw was that people were very happy to leave those roots and follow their own paths and and you can see that the religion has indeed played a significant part in the development of society and religion has indeed played a significant part in in how our moral understanding works. Furthermore, philosophically and scientifically, we can see that a godless universe loses all int all meaning and all purpose and all value. And, and essentially what I'm trying to say is that, well, value meaning, the intrinsic worth of people is kind of intertwined with the moral, the moral struggle or the moral landscape because it's very hard to create any moral system without some first uh, assumption in the idea that humans are valuable. Of course, if humans are unvaluable, you then lose a lot of the ideas that you should not kill. Well, wh what's, a, what's, what's so bad about killing a valueless human being? And that's something that you should think about. It's like, well, not only does God provide the commands or the rules per se, you also have God providing value for humans, which makes these the reasoning behind those rules even more even more powerful it's like not only are you having to follow these commands to follow the design the purpose that was given to you you also have to fight or you have to struggle against the fact that the people that you're harming for example if you kill someone you're harming someone with intrinsic value and that makes it even more stronger it makes it more reasonable for why you should not violate someone else's value someone else because they have intrinsic value that is found in God. However, in science and atheism, this problem completely is arises is that you no longer have some sense of intrinsic value for humans. Man has to create their own values and you really have to question yourself. Well, what happens when someone creates a different value from someone else? What if in someone's worldview, some people have more value and this value is definitely subjective, but what happens if someone supports a value system or structure or hierarchical system where some people are to be seen as slaves or or untermenschen and, and not to say that the untermenschen is necessarily bad in Nietzsche's sense but but what happens when you have a society of of slavery or, or someone else who says we want complete communism and you have different of these ideas put together you soon have these contradictory ideas which cannot all be right at the same time but what but without that fundamental grounding from that from God or these fundamental rules that you have to get, well, 
you soon lose the the judgment or the standard upon which which of these systems are objectively right and objectively wrong. And of course, some people like to say you should experiment with them and figure out what works or not. But surely that is not the way how you figure out what's right or not. You don't figure out whether killing is right or not by just going around killing people to experiment whether that's beneficial. I mean, of course, in some ev in some evolutionary sense, you might be able to say, well, if you go around murdering people, the species wouldn't survive. But at the same time, if, if the strong go around killing people and the weak people just die off, then in some sense, it is indeed evolutionary beneficial because the good genes do pass on to pass on to the your children or your offspring, and then you get a stronger race of people. And and of course, you could see these different formulations, which which d just demonstrates the problems, the moral problem of of atheism in the sense that if you lose your if you if you if you lose that theistic underpinning, you completely lose all sense of moral justification or groundings. And of course, there are or there have been attempts at atheistic morals, for example. And of course. One of the best ways, or one of the most common ones, is Kant. However, you can see that Kant also seems to, at the end of the day, turn back to God for the grounding of his morals, or the ultimate kind of fundamental grounding for the morals does go back to God. However, some people like to say that Kant's ideas are kind of atheistic morals, or some people like to say that benefits or pleasure, like some sense of hedonistic idea, is indeed a very good way for morals. However, these things are quite poor in a sense of to find some objective moral grounding because well why should you choose pleasure and not pain instead and and of course you could say well pleasure seems to be more beneficial to us but it doesn't lead to any objective reason for why we ought or why we must objectively choose pleasure over pain because some people do seem to choose pain over pleasure especially some masochists and and of course you might say well that pain to them is pleasure but then but then it kind of defeats a purpose i mean some people do just like or some psychopaths just like inflicting pain on others and inflicting pain sometimes on themselves as well. And it's not because they necessarily find pleasure out of that pain. It's just because they like that pain and 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 elevate that pain in in opposition to that pleasure. And hence, there is once again a non-objective grounding to see which one is better than others. Of course, you can say more people believe in one than the other, but then surely more people doesn't mean it's right. And and as a result, you can see that there are significant problems with these different systems. And I'm not going to say this is a compre comprehensive refutal of atheistic systems because that's not essentially what I'm trying to do in this video. What I'm trying to do is just demonstrate that there is a problem of moral nihilism when God, if, when you take away that belief in God. And that's essentially what I'm trying to show you. And, and this is just something of food for thought because it would be impossible for me to go over every single atheistic formulation of objective morals. And... And that's just going to go way beyond the scope of this video. So essentially, once again, to formulate my argument, with God, you have values, you have morals, you have an objective grounding for your reasoning to treat people with respect, treat people with dignity. However, if you take away God, you also lose that objective standing. Of course, you might have subjective formulations. However, that is ultimately subjective. Someone else could just say something a different formulation, and you don't have an objective standard to see which one is better. Of course, if you presuppose a standard, then you could have some sense of objectivity, but there's no reason why you should presuppose that. And if someone presupposes another standard, then you're always going to be at odds without a ultimate or a ulterior or a higher source, which gives you that standard upon which you must develop it off of, and then you could have some objective grounding. So that's essentially what I'm trying to say. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Of course, if you want me to clarify anything, let me know in the comment section below. The reason why I have this kind of this more broader and more abstract kind of conversation in this video is essentially because I I want to just give you kind of the main ideas out there. And if you want more, well, more specific discussions, make sure you let me know in the comments below or join my Discord server where there's a group of different people from agnostics, atheists, and all that cool stuff on my Discord server. The link for that is also in the description below. So make sure you go check that out. If you want to reach out to me or feedback or suggest any comments there, feel free to do it there or in the comments below. Greatly appreciate what you guys tell me and I will try to incorporate them into my videos. Hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure to stay safe, have fun, God bless. I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye. Have a great week. I'll see you soon. Thank you for watching.